morning, friends. I'm grateful to be together with you all. Uh, like Rich said, I was, I was gone also last week to the wedding, and it was good to be together. I like how he said his family's all around, and good to see the family that's far away. He didn't mention seeing the family that lives 30 minutes away, but, uh, you know, grateful for that. I want to invite you as we uh, begin here to turn in your Bibles to the book of Galatians. Um, and and uh, for reference... There's going to be a lot of reference points to the book of Hebrews. Uh, we're not going to read a lot of uh, sections out of Hebrews, but we're going to refer to it several times throughout, throughout this. Uh, this. We, we're beginning a, story, uh, uh, beginning a series on the book of Galatians, uh, about four weeks here going through this, this beautiful, awesome book, um, this, this word of the Lord. And as we get there, uh, I'm going to ask an opening question. How many of you are runners? Not like, yeah, no, <laughs> look, look up Miller's already like, I got, I got, uh, and he was like, no, no, yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, 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 I, I'm not, uh, I, it's interesting, I played um, four years of college soccer, and you run a lot in soccer, and, and you run miles, but without a ball, and I played, played basketball as well, and uh, I could run for that, but when the coach said, get on the line, and you ran for the sake of running, I hated that. And then for soccer, we had to run three miles or five miles in the morning. Just, just get up really early in the morning and just run. And nobody should do that. Um, but, but there's a point, like, uh, for me now, I realize that, that I need to maybe, I'm not going to start, I'm not going to take up running. You don't need to worry. Uh, but if I did, you know, it'd probably look a little bit like some of this. You know, you just, you get running, you get disoriented, and uh, you forget that, uh, that there's a goal in mind to running. And I don't know what that goal is. Uh, the goal of running, other than just to, you know, torment yourself. Um, yeah, yeah, there's, there's that reality. I tell my wife that I'm going to take up running uh, every morning, but then I don't. Um, it's our running joke. Um, but yeah, there, there's, there's this process of running. I don't know if you saw this story where, where a guy um, was so, he had run so long, so far, and thought he reached the finish line, and he didn't. And so, so somebody actually helped him, who was behind him, helped him find the finish line. When I run, it looks a little bit more like this. Um, and uh, <laughs> so I'm not there. We talk about running. We're not talking about running, but we are talking about being disoriented. And when it comes to the book of Galatians, the word, for, uh, the word disoriented is a very good word to have in the back of your mind as we begin to look. So let's begin the, the letter of Galatians. Chapter 1, verse 1 through 9. I'm just going to read the first nine verses. We'll pick up some, some of the rest later. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1 through 9. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. Now, if they thought the age was evil then, can we say the same thing today? Who gave himself to our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then verse 6 goes on. I would like you to read this part with me. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than the one that you accepted, let them be under God's curse. So there we go. This is, this is a, how good the book of Galatians, it begins with some niceties at the beginning. Paul, hey, I'm, it's, it's Paul, grace and peace to you. I love you guys. Now let me just get into why are you guys doing so many things wrong? So let's jump into what's going on. The, the church in Galatia, it's actually <laughs> churches as it describes. Uh, the Galatian churches, you understand back then, the churches often met in homes. And so you would have all these kind of smaller churches. It was all considered one church, but they all met in different places, kind of like today. We have all our different uh, gatherings of believers here, even in our own community. Yet we're all part of the one true church, the church of God in Jesus Christ. And so the Galatian churches had received the gospel, and they were growing, they were, they were spreading, but then suddenly uh, they became severely disoriented in their faith. And, and the reality is the church, the church didn't do this intentionally. It's not like they said, hey, we're going to set out and follow something else. 
It wasn't because they were exhausted because they'd been running the race along. They were fairly new to the, to the, whole, the whole faith. Uh, it wasn't lack of effort, but rather some people had come in and led them astray from the truth of Christ. So rather than them just getting tired and wandering off path like we saw earlier, it looked a little more like this. Ooh, yeah. yeah they, so they're running the race, and then, and then somebody... Yeah. Rosie? No, you? Careful. You never know. Uh, they were disoriented, not because of exhaustion, but because somebody had come in and led them astray and say, well, how could that happen? How does that happen? And so words, it happens more often than you would think. These people, they use guilt, they use perva- perva- persuasive, that's the word, arguments, manipulations, human logic to deceive and convince. So let's look at what it says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, as Paul, and after that first section, he begins to explain some of his credentials and his history, and he jumps right back into the meat of what's going on. So Galatians 3, verse 1 through 5, let's read it together. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing, if it really was for nothing? Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? So this disorientation, the deception is effective with them, and the reason that they get, they get taken out, really, is because it's, it's veiled. It's a veiled deception. It's not like people came and said, no, 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 don't, don't believe in Jesus. Instead, believe in this. So they're saying it's good that you believe in Jesus, but what you don't know is that you also need to believe in this. And therein lies one of the biggest warnings that we have is that we, yeah, you receive the gospel, but you need more than the gospel. And this is what it says. The deception was effective because it used portions of scripture. Deception is one thing, but then to take the word itself and use that to distort the Christian faith. It's not the first time that this happens, and it is not the last time it happens with Galatia. We see this still present today. What's going on is they're using the law of Moses. If you don't know what the law of Moses, and you've got your Bible in your hands, you can hold up the first five books of the Bible, and, and that is what we would call the law of Moses. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It explains the law of Moses. Now, most of us, when we say the law of Moses, we would think the ten commandments, right? And so let's do, let's do a, a Ten Commandment quiz. Yeah, okay, you ready? So, so let's, let's go backwards instead of going forwards. What's, what's, the, let's, what's the last commandment? Is you shall not covet. All right, you shall not covet. Uh, and then we have do not bear false witness. You can say this aloud with me. You shall not steal. You can tell your neighbor these things, apparently. Do not commit adultery. And do not murder. Do we agree that these things are part of the Ten Commandments? Okay, yeah, and you agree these are good things, right? Good things to not do. All right, the rest of them are this. Honor your father and mother. Parents say amen. Amen. And kids say yes, sir. (laughs) Oh, they didn't. All right, and the next one is keep the Sabbath holy. And then we have the first three, which we're looking at last. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. No idols. No other gods before me. All right. We're going to do an exercise here. You're going to love it. Trust me. We're going to see whether or not you're guilty of breaking the Ten Commandments. We're going to start with the, the last one and make our way back up. So how many of you, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. Um, I mean, we could, but that's up to you. But how many of you have ever had a God other than the Lord God? How many of you have ever worshipped something, someone, some? Thing, you can think of a lot of things that it might be. It could be money, it could be a, a passion, it could be something like that. Ever worship anything besides God? Have you ever done that? Have you ever placed or built your life around something, literally an idol? Most of all, we would probably say money is probably one of the biggest idols that we face in the nation, but that's not the only one. Popularity, praise, uh, a, a success, all those can be idols that we pursue. Which, in other words, it's something that we put our passion behind, our worship behind. How many of you have ever taken the Lord's name in vain? 
Are we, are, do we have anybody who's guilty yet of breaking one of the Ten Commandments? So you can raise your hand on this one. Half of you have broken one of those. Keep the Sabbath holy. Um, honor your father and mother kids. Brock. <laughs> Tyson Joy. Yeah. Ever not honor your mom and dad? Um, I could tell you stories. Let's go, let's go backwards. Um, do not murder. Anybody here? Well, we won't ask that question. Um, <laughs> Jesus says that, that when you hold hatred within your heart, this is in the Sermon on the Mount, it is the same thing as murder. So if you've hated somebody in your heart, then you're guilty of murder. Committing adultery in the same way, whether it's in the flesh or in the heart and mind, same thing. Have you committed adultery in the flesh or in the heart and mind? Stealing. Um, generally, that is done in the flesh. How many of you have, have actually stolen something this morning? Um, welcome, Jacob. This is just in time. <laughs> Do not bear false witness. How many have lied? And coveting is definitely not something that our nation uh, is built around. So we would not say we covet, right? wanted something that was something or someone that was not yours. So, so let me ask you a question. How many of you are guilty of breaking at least one of the Ten Commandments? Two, three, four, five, all? Yeah, all of them. And we look at that, and there's reality. And the reason, there's a reason. It's not just to make you feel guilty this morning, uh, but that helps too. Uh, what we're looking at is the gospel. And we need to understand, if we're going to look at the book of Galatians and the churches in Galatia and why they're led astray, what is it about the law of Moses that, that, that convinces them to abandon the gospel? And how is it by looking at the Ten Commandments? Do you think that by going through what we just did this morning, those Ten Commandments, any of you abandon Jesus? I say no, right? So how is it that the churches in Galatia did? What happened to them? How did they get so disoriented that they lost the focus of their faith? Well, let's look at the gospel. As my son-in-law said very simply when he was talking about evangelism, when we talk about the gospel, we can summarize it as the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and why that matters. Why does it matter to you? The life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and why it matters to you. That is a very, very basic understanding. We're going to pack that a little bit more. So that's the gospel. Then what is the lie that the church in Galatia had? The Galatians were led to, to lead, they were, they were led to replace this gospel. And in other words, it was like, it's great that you have Jesus, guys. That's great that you love Jesus. It's great that you accept what he's done for you. But you also need to follow all the laws and rules to really be saved. That's the lie that the churches of Galatia said. And some of you say, well, I don't know if that's such a bad lie. Those commandments that we just read, those are good commandments. We agree, right? We should not do those things. Right, but is our salvation in not doing those things? There's the fine line, and this is where the church in Galatia struggled. They were led astray to believe that they had to then go back and fulfill, not just receive Jesus, but also fulfill all this list of rights and wrongs and rules, those made by God and those made by mankind in order to be righteous. Contract. Uh, we all know about contracts, right? And some of you have bought vehicles, you've bought houses, you've signed a contract. You know what that means, right? When we talk about the law, we should understand it as a contract. Uh, Old Testament law is basically a contract. We would call it a covenant, which is a holy contract. A contract. The law given in the Old Testament by Moses was a contract. It's between two parties, the people of Israel and God himself. And it was a very, very simple contract, but... We'll find how difficult it was at the same time. The contract came with a very clear requirement, and it also came with a very clear reward or punishment. You fulfill this contract, there's reward. You break this contract, there's punishment. Same thing that you have in other contracts today. It's stuff we understand, stuff that makes sense, right? So let's look at this contract in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 16 through 20. This is Moses speaking, and as he's as he's written this letter to the people and summarizing everything that God has commanded. And it says this, and he says, For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Let's read that part again together, verse 16. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase. 
and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. Um, verse 17. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be, be what? Wow, okay. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may ha love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So choose life. Would you tell your neighbor to choose life this morning? Let it, let's let that phrase sink in for a second. Go ahead. You can, you can use your your big boy and girl voices. Tell them to choose life. Yeah, that's right. We see that the people of Israel were given this condition by God and said, okay, this is, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to give you these commands. And if you follow them, I'm going to bless you. Things are going to be amazing. You're going to have life. Things are going to be good. You're going to be blessed. You're going to receive the blessings that I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But if you don't, then, then you're not going to receive the blessings. In fact, you're going to receive the opposite. You're going to receive destruction. You're going to receive curses. And so it seems kind of just out there. You think the people would say, well, God, that seems a little strict. But that's not what the people say. This is what the people say. We see this in Exodus 24, verse 7. He took them, he, then he took the book of the covenant, which is what we were just reading, and read it to the people. And they responded. Let's, let's say what they responded aloud together. We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. They probably should have said, we will try. Would you help us? But they didn't. They said very boldly, we will obey. So we understand this is the contract. We got that? You, it makes sense that this is the contract God made with the people of Israel. So then where's this, this problem come in as we understand this contract? Then? The law given in the Old Testament by Moses was this contract, as we said. If they fulfill it, then they receive blessings in life. Sound good? If they break it, then they receive curses and death. Fulfillment, though, required not just being kind of good. And you've heard people say, how many of you have ever heard say, well, I'm a good person? And how would you define good person? Fulfillment required obeying all of the commands completely. If you broke one, then you're done. You're guilty of breaking it all. These are God's conditions, not mine. Don't say, Chris, you're a bad pastor, you're a bad dad. This is God's conditions, not mine. We'll see why in a minute. But the full gospel and why it matters, the life of Jesus, as we talked about, the gospel is the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and why it matters. So why does it matter to you? Let's look at the life of Jesus. How Perfect was Jesus. Perfect, perfect, right? Completely perfect. There is no such thing as perfect, perfect. He's either perfect or not perfect. Jesus lived a perfect life despite the fact that he was tempted in every single way. How many of you are tempted? Okay, four of us. Four of us. I saw the hand for us, yeah. Thank you. Four of us are tempted. The rest of us need to understand what being tempted means. Life of Jesus. Jesus lived a perfect life even though he was tempted in every way just as we are. Make sense? Yes. In other words, Jesus fulfilled the law. In fact, he said that in the Sermon on the Mount. I did not come to abolish the law. I didn't come to destroy. I didn't come to tear up the contract. I came to fulfill it. He won the blessings. Do you understand that? Jesus fulfilled the contract. Therefore, Jesus won the reward, receives the reward of life, of blessings. You with me? Now, the death of Jesus, what did that do? Well, the death of Jesus, though perfect, Jesus set aside the blessings that he won and instead took upon himself the guilt of all of you lawbreakers throughout all history. Every single one of us who has broken even a single command, that means we're guilty of breaking the whole thing. He takes the guilt, which means he takes the curses, upon himself 
which means he takes the death upon himself. He died to take the curse, the guilt, the death of us all that we all deserve for breaking the commandments. One time for all people. You can read about that in Hebrews chapter 10. Does that make sense? Jesus fulfilled the contract. We can't fulfill the contract. So instead, he swaps it. Takes our punishment. Right? So the gospel and the contract. In his life, Jesus won the blessings. Do you agree with that? By his perfection. In his death, Jesus paid the punishment for our guilt and defeat, defeated the curse. Do you agree with that? Yeah, okay. Then let's keep moving. There's more. And it's good. Because Jesus didn't just live, which was awesome. And Jesus didn't just die, which is really important. But there's more. And it's really good news. And that's why when we sing, we don't sing just sad, somber songs. Because if Jesus was still dead, we would sing sad songs. We sing happy songs. Why? Because Jesus did not stay dead. You know this. You've been here before. You've heard this before. I believe it, right? Jesus rose from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus. Why does that matter? Because Jesus didn't stay dead. Amen? And then if he had, do you understand, if Jesus had stayed dead, he would be powerless to help us. He would be buried. He would be powerless to help us. But he rose from the dead in power, and what does that mean? So that now, now, because Jesus rose from the dead, the, resurrection of Je- the resurrected Jesus can not only forever, forever, say forever, forever, <laughs> remove, your, remove and forgive your sin. Not just once, not just, I'm sorry, I made a mistake yesterday, please forgive me, and then ask again the next day. No, forever he can remove your sin and your guilt. But he can also, and this is a part that I think so many of us don't let him do. You can just imagine Jesus taking all your sin and pulling it off and burning it up and then wrapping his perfection and his righteousness around you. Not because of anything you have done, but because of what he's done. And because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gives us, because he lived a perfect life, died the death of a sinner, and rose from the dead, he can give you the blessings that he won by fulfilling the contract. And those blessings are not small blessings. They are tremendous, tremendous blessings. So when we see the foolish Galatians, what's going on with it? The, the Galatian believers are trying to, to, back, uh, to go back and live out the law for themselves. Like, yeah, Jesus, thanks for living and dying and rising from the dead so I can be forgiven forever. Now I'm going to go back and try to fulfill all those commandments. Why is that wrong? The, the law was already fulfilled. And the law is, as the book, as you should read this letter, the law is something you can't live out yourself anyway because you're broken, you're imperfect. And so they could try, but it was only going to show them over and over again that they needed what? The salvation of Jesus Christ, right? The law that Jesus already fulfilled for them. They're trying to live it out for themselves. And this is devastating. Why is this such a problem? And this is where, this is why really the book of Galatians is written. Is that we're going to have three more series, three more sermons on it after this. We're covering the whole thing in one. Yeah, but there's more. Not only was it impossible to fulfill the law, you could try. You could try to live out the Ten Commandments alone and try to live them perfectly the rest of your life, and I guarantee you will make a mistake. I guarantee you will fall. Why? Because you're human. We'll get to that in Galatians 5. They were diminishing. They were discrediting by trying to live out the law. And friends, don't just hear the Galatians now, but hear us now too. When we try to be good enough, when we try to earn forgiveness, when we try to say that we're better people than other people, whenever we make man-made law or God-made law as our way of salvation and the way that we're going to make it to heaven, we sin majorly because we discredit, we diminish, we discard the, the, uh, we discard the cross of Christ, the free gift of salvation. So anytime I try to measure up by any means other than the fact that I'm not good enough and only can I be saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, I am, I'm discarding the cross. I'm discarding everything that Jesus says. I'm discarding his life, his death, his resurrection. I'm saying, I don't need you, Jesus. I can do it this way instead. And why do we go for that? Well, we're, we're prideful people. The foolish Galatians had done this and they were pursuing this. Our only hope of salvation is in receiving the righteousness of Jesus. Do we understand that? The only thing that we can do, the only way that I can stand before you as a pastor, as somebody that I can say, before God, I am perfect even though I'm a broken person just like you. 
I can say before God I am perfect. Why? Because God has wrapped me in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he's taken my sin and removed it as far away as the east is from the west. This is the gospel. It is a free gift from the Lord who has won it for you because God so loved you. Not just the world, God loves you. And maybe you're hearing that this morning and it's finally landing for the first time. Maybe you've heard it all your life. Let it land for you in the morning. God loves you so much. So, so how do we avoid being like the Galatians and getting taken out in the middle of the run? How, how, do, we, how do we not fall for that? Um, well, one, don't run in a field. Ever. Ever. Just play soccer. You have at least a weapon and the ball that you can protect yourself. The foolish Galatians, why would they and, and why would you do such a thing? Uh, there's three things I think that stand out to me that I think we need to hear this morning and, and we'll wrap up with these three. Understand that the reason they fell for it is they did not remember the simple truth of the gospel. They lost focus. Pretty simple. And, and, and I think part of that is, is it is so simple. The salvation that God has offered is so simple that it doesn't matter how smart you are, how dumb you are, where you were born, uh, what your heritage is, how much money you have or don't have, doesn't matter any of that. The same is true for everyone, that God loves you enough to take your sin and pay the cost of it and to wrap you in his perfect righteousness instead. And that's his free gift to anyone who will believe. But they didn't remember that. They complicated it. Second thing is they, they listened to false teachers. How do you know for true teachers, false teachers? We talked about that a while ago, but the false teachers will always try to manipulate and justify. True teachers will keep it simple on the gospel. And I think the third thing, and this is the area that we have to be really careful of, and, and even today in our world and what's all going on, and, and I think the battles that face the church ahead, is we like to have control and we like to have power. Friends, we're not guaranteed that. I guaranteed power and control here. There is one who has power. There is one who has control. And who is that? That is the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He has power and he has authority. And we are his. And we are in his power and in his control. Friends, we will probably see a loss of power over the years, control over the years. If nothing else, as you get older, it happens. It's just in your own body, let alone everything else in life. But as church, how do we stay focused? Will you keep the truth of the gospel simple and straight in front of you all the time. So what about you? Do you try to earn God's forgiveness? Take a moment just to ask the Lord, in what ways do I try to earn your love, God? In what ways do I try to earn your forgiveness? Lord, we confess this morning that we overcomplicate the simple truth of the gospel that you've given to us. We confess, Lord, that we try to be good enough. And as I think of of a young man yesterday who told me that he probably wouldn't be at church because he's not a good person. Lord, how we often measure that in our own terms. But God, none of us stands a chance before you. For all of us have fallen away. All of us have sinned. And so, Lord God, we come to you. Uh, We ask that you would forgive us of our sin, that you would take up that curse, that brokenness, that destruction that we deserve. And let the cross of Christ mark that off for us. And Lord, we ask even greater that you would see us then and clothe us in your perfection, your righteousness, as a free gift that is only from you. Lord, we can never, ever deserve it. We can never do anything to earn it. But Lord, we'll gladly say yes. I'll receive that. And we'll receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, throw off. We need to do these things on a regular basis. We need to throw off the pride. When we ever try to measure ourselves against other people, throw that off. Don't let it it have a foothold in your life. Throw off the shackles of, of rules, of laws that keep you from the grace of God. There are things that we should do and things we shouldn't do. We all agree on that. But it's a different motivation that comes from Christ. Throw off guilt. Throw off sin that Jesus died. You don't, you don't need to wallow in your sin after you've asked for forgiveness of it. He's, he's forgiven it. And then what do you do? You receive and you put on the forgiveness of God. You receive and you put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You receive 
the inheritance, the blessings that have been won, peace with God, and eternal life in heaven. You just receive them. You say, yes, God, I'll take those. I'll receive those gladly. And you receive and you embrace the gift of the Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, and that is the difference maker in what happens next in our lives, which we'll see in the coming weeks. I'm gonna invite the worship team up as we close. Hebrews chapter 12, verse one through two. Would you read it with me? Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So friends, what is your response? Saved by grace. Have you said yes to that? Have you received that? Have you let the Lord pay the cost of your sin? Have you let the Lord wrap you in his perfect righteousness? To do that, we have to surrender. We surrender our lives to Jesus. And we ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit to fill us so that we can then walk with God each day. It's not about trying harder. It's about receiving what he's given us. And so as we do that, then we close with this prayer each week. Abba, Father, yes. I say it again, yes. I say yes to your gift of salvation. I say yes to your Holy Spirit. I say yes to growing to know you more. I say yes to using my life to bless others. I say yes to the call you have for me, even if it isn't what I expect. Father, give me a spirit of willingness to follow you and give me special moments of treasured time with you. Give me your courage, but also please give me your forgiveness when I fail. Help me to say yes to your church and take steps to love those around me. And all this, may your kingdom come. Amen, amen.